So I'm Patrick Henry Bass, and whether at Essence Magazine or The Takeaway on Public Radio, I'm always interested in what's new, what's exciting, who's innovative and hot, and I can't think of someone who uh, fulfills all four of those missions that I have than Miss Margaret Rose Vendry's uh, artist who has uh, quite an incredible collection uh, that she's putting together that is all the buzz and all the rage, and so we're going to talk to her now about uh, the art, this project, and... Um, What's next for her? So thank you for being here today. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Right now, album covers are having a renaissance in terms of art and collectors and collecting. And as a books editor, I've been seeing a lot of uh, books come across my desk that you know are odes and tributes to yes. uh, album covers, whether it's yes. you know from the Blue Note period, you know the great jazz label, or whether it's some of the rock and roll, you know iconic rock and roll albums. And so the African Diva Project is. Uh, an homage to our uh, musical divas uh, and their album covers, but with an edge. Talk about the project a little bit uh, and what your goal and mission is in terms of the African Diva Project. Well, the beginning of the goal is to interrogate in many ways the idea of what is beauty and what is beauty as it pertains to black women. And um, being one myself, it's something that I've always been um, struggling with or sometimes feeling a champion over, but it has always been a question of whether or not our beauty can reach an ideal beauty. The essential takeaway is, has to do with the efforts that are made around creating a, as close as possible a look of the ideal beauty in the Western world for African American women that are in the public eye. I can refer you to the piece behind me, Betty Davis's, where she was one of the more audacious. Um, I, some of the other divas that I've treated her were a, a bit more modest about their sexuality, but she was one of those that was very audacious and very outgoing about her sexuality in her music, in her persona, and she didn't last very long. There was something, of, something abrasive about what she did, and she just sort of fell away. So the idea behind the, the African Divas whole series was to figure out how I could make an object that was beautiful, but still a reflection of black female beauty, and find a way to connect that to Africa, because African art has the same issue as well. Even though it's heavily collected, it's still, you, the, the, the majority of people that look at African art see ugly. And the same kinds of things happen to black women. That no matter how hard you try, you never reach that Western ideal of beauty. Well, why the masks? Well, um, there is a, a level of vulnerability that these women, especially as soloists, and you see them alone on the album, but you see them alone on stage as well. There's a vulnerability that these women have when they, are, they become public property, when they become public performers. One of the things about the performers in Africa when they don a mask, and they are male performers for the most part, when they don the mask, they become very important public figures. They are protected by the mask, they are empowered by the mask. And women are not allowed to wear them in Africa. There's only one group where they actually do masquerade in a, in a mask. So what I've done is taken this power back for women, and I've given them to these performers who are very vulnerable, who are very much alone in their act, in their performance. So it, it's, it just makes sense that images that are created, designed for production and then from marketing by mostly white designers and you have and white male designers and you have this this object that will transform them and protect them that is also the province of men so these women that i have made are extremely powerful beings because of that they have been take they have taken back what really, in many cases, belong to them. Because even the masks that are representative of female deities and female ancestors are danced by men. Because the feeling in, in Africa is that a man is powerful enough, a woman could not carry the weight of that powerful deity, that it would have to be a man to do it. 
but it's also a way of maintaining control. And I saw them all as beautiful beings. Yeah, I, I would float them off the LP before I started to paint. I could see them beyond the packaging. And it's the same way that I feel about African art. Like, I go to the Rockefeller galleries here in, at the Metropolitan all the time to visit my friends in there. And the same, I get the same feeling that boxed in, perfectly lighted, can't be touched, what's happened to African art. And even though not necessarily considered beautiful, the powerful nature of it is still there. It's still there, even though we can't access it. I mean, these are things that are supposed to be moving. I mean, when they appear, when an African mass appears, it is not just standing still. It's dawned and it's, it's ripping through the village or it's making statements. There's gestures that are missing. And so when they're on these women, the gesture is coming back. And the writing in the background is a, is a way to get the figure to move even further. So you know, it's through my script that you, you find your way to get them to perform for you even though it's a still image. Talk about music uh, and, and how that informs your art. Well, I listen to whoever I'm painting, mm -hmm. which is kind of also very obsessive, but it works. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a playlist that is now substantial because there's 28 <laughs> divas that are finished, right. and I do it on a shuffle on the iPods. So it's wonderful. Um, sometimes, the music, like with Nancy, uh, she's, she really is the kind of singer who is giving you guidance. Yes, yes. But she is usually singing about herself. So in Face It Girl, It's Over, she's talking to herself. And you don't really get it till it's towards the end. Right, right. So that, that sort of you know, uh, psychological thing that is going on, that informed the color in her background. Because it's blue and gold. Right. It, it comes across as an iridescent green, right. but the, the color of her music, for me, was very blue. But there was, there was this sort of sheen to the storyline behind what she was doing. So I mixed the two together, and, it, and the color made me happy. So I used it. So the music really does make a difference. And the era, too, because Nancy Wilson really wasn't my singer in my youth. But those singers like Aretha, like um, Dionne Warwick, yes, yes. whose songs I knew all the words, even though I didn't remember I knew all the words, when I'm painting those, so much of the happy times of just not necessarily happy because of what was going on, happy because I was young and able-bodied and still had so much future that I was expecting to live through and be happy in came back to me. So her painting had a lot of very free brushwork in it. I thought the choice of Minnie Ripperton was, uh, <laughs> because, because Minnie has such a short career, yes. but such yes. an impact. I mean, even now, even today, and people don't affiliate her with the, I mean, Loving You is one of the most sensual mm -hmm. songs, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, because of you know, the, the circumstances of her death, no one wants to think of sensuality, think of the greatness of the voice, mm -hmm. and yet you've returned her to her sensuality and also yes. her greatness as yes. well. Yes, well that album, that album, front and back, really is very blatantly yes. sexual. Yes. Very sensual, yeah. but very sexual as well. And um, this one in particular, that Naples yellow that's in the background, when I, when I, and I usually put the background, there's two layers so that when I write into it, the color doesn't change. So there's a flat layer of the same color underneath it before I put the waxed layer. And um, when I saw her floating in the yellow, you know, not being arrogant, even though I can be, but not being arrogant, um, I saw a Michelangelo figure. Wow. You know that, have you been to the Sistine Chapel? Have you seen the Sistine not, Chapel? Not yet, but I'm getting there, well, so my bucket as, list. as an art historian, I had to make that <laughs> sojourn. So, you know, and I laid on the ground. Wow. And it was after it was cleaned. So yellows were like, they were popping. And you had these angels floating through the air up there. It was just fabulous. And when I stepped back from her, I was like, 
Well, oh my goodness, you could be on the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> and, she's, and she's like an angel in so many ways. Oh, yes, her, yes. Their voices, and her voice is heavenly. People talk about, you know, how celestial it was and right, the mixture right, of that and then right. the blatant sexuality that she had, you know. The art world is, you know, for, for all of the, the efforts of the, the Gorilla Girls and, you know, mm -hmm. for, for all the efforts of co the conversations about the art world opening up more, it still seems to be a very white male dominated place. Uh, how do you, how do you, how did you keep going on in a, such a, such an incredibly challenging calling where there would be so many odds against anyone who yeah. picks up no, a paintbrush, it's true. It's true. anyone who would do that, that's a very difficult it's path true. to walk down. So how, how do you, how did you, and how do you keep going on? Well, part of it is, how much I know about artists and in history and those that have hung in there and had faith in their own talent and their own skills and just kept making it. You know, so the Giacometti's of the world, you know, the Van Gogh's of the world, who just knew that they had something that they had to do. So I took a, I took a great risk in walking away from a, a lifetime job as an art historian and a professor because I had to get this done and I couldn't do it at the same time. And I couldn't wait to retire anymore. So part of it was my own ticking clock. <laughs> Whereas I, I had this skill that I wanted to mature and I just started working. The work stands on its own, but what's also great is that you're providing a document and visual evidence of the beauty of these African-American female icons, you know, um, some great, some we should know, and now we'll know because of this uh, oh, incredible great. series yes. that you're doing, which uh, I can't wait for it to finish up. It's uh, been a pleasure. Absolutely. So <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> Next time, you have to take one home. <laughs>